Vladis Mikanas described this as his immortal game, and it really does sparkle. I think you're going to enjoy this. Uh, this was played in the Georgian Championship in 1941, and there's a very wonderful photo uh, of from this event. And in fact, Mikanas is third from the right. You can see him with his chin, with his hand on his chin, watching the game with a nice smile on his face. Um, uh, this photo was supplied by Douglas Griff Griffin, uh, and indeed the annotations to this game were translated by Douglas Griffin, and he runs a fantastic website called Soviet Chess History, um, where he's translated a lot of uh, annotations from games played in the Soviet Union. Douglas, I should say, uh, is Scottish. He's played for the Scottish team, but he's a Russian speaker as well. Um, and this website is a fantastic source of information, really fascinating. Uh, you'll find the link in the description down there. It's uh, I would really recommend it. So anyway, I'm very grateful to him. So uh, let me tell you a bit about Mekanes. So he was actually born in Estonia in 1910. He then, well, he, he actually emigrated to Lithuania and represented Lithuania in the 1930s in, in the Chess Olympiads. And, you know, he was pretty successful. Then, of course, in 1940, Lithuania was annexed by the Soviet Union and he became a Soviet citizen. And he played in, in several Soviet championships, a successful player. Um, and this was played in the Georgian Championship in 1941. Okay, that needs some explaining. Basically, he was invited uh, to play in the tournament, but of course he wouldn't um, wouldn't be able to become Georgian champion, but still, he, he managed to be invited to the tournament. Um, so I'm going to read from these annotations supplied by Donis, Douglas Griffin, and Mikanas writes... At the beginning of the year 1941, I was invited to participate au concours in the championship of Georgia. I'd heard much about the hosp hospitality of the Georgian people, their culture and customs, and therefore I happily accepted the invitation. In Lithuania, the winter of 1941 was frosty. Mos Moscow was still colder, but once I was comfortably ensconced in the Moscow-Tbilisi express train, I felt that warmth was approaching. Sunny Georgia greeted me cordially. Immediately new friends appeared, although at the chessboard they did not recognise friendship. Ebralitsa became champion of the Republic. I occupied only third place, but I managed to play a game that I can boldly call my immortal. Pay attention to the position. A problem like mate in the middle of the board. So that's Mikanas talking about his game. Right, finally, that was a long introduction. Let's get on with the game. It's a Queen's Gambit, so I'm particularly interested in the opening. Mikanas playing white against Lebedev. And here uh, Lebedev plays h6. Now he mixes his systems. Okay, I'll get into this more in a second. So everything very orthodox so far. Now here, yeah, one can play knight bd7 or b6, uh, and that's tar b6 is a over. But Lebedev plays a kind of orthodox variation, except with these two moves, h6 and bishop h4 included. And that small difference actually makes a massive difference if black plays in, well, the, the normal orthodox way. The thing is this, that when the bishop is on, whoops, when the bishop is on g5, then it has to exchange on e7, and that's what black wants. So quick compare and contrast. In this position, normal orthodox variation, white has to exchange here. And that clears the back rank. This rook can come into the middle, you know, sometimes b6, bishop b7, rooks come into the middle. It eases the congestion. But the difference here is that that bishop 
doesn't have to exchange, so it can just drop to g3. And that still leaves black a little bit congested. And this is well known um, that, well, white just has, has the more comfortable position here. But still, black is very solid, it's not that bad. Here black played a6, Michaelis recommends knight f6 followed by bishop d7 and I think that is a much better way for black to play. Just bringing this bishop into the game. Still more comfortable for white but playable. a6, now white could play a4 but Michaelis already has his eye on the king side and his bishop claims this diagonal. Knight f6, knight e5, and again, I think bishop d7 is normal. Um, Mikena said bishop d7 was essential. Instead, black played bishop d6. Now, that is a bit of an odd move, because after bishop h4, that pin is annoying, and the bishop just has to come back again. So black has lost time. And Mikena continues with his plan of bishop b1, and... Already white is, yeah, he's about to set up this battery on the diagonal, which is incredibly dangerous. And here, well, black plays a really, really risky move. He plays queen e8, and clearly the idea is that after queen c2, black can block the diagonal with g6, and the queen offers support for the pawn but this is very risky as we're about to see um, then again queen c7 queen c2 the rook moves away this can lead to, to disaster um, even if white just continues with f4 um, but you can also take here and play knight g4 or just f4 again, and white has a huge attack. Reminds me of um, Nippon Nishi against Alexienko, actually, in the recent candidates tournament. Anyway, queen e8 played, and that creates a traffic jam, which Mekenas succeeds in exploiting beautifully. Pawn takes pawn. And here, well, obviously, that's no good because... Um, yeah, bishop takes pawn, we can play queen c2, followed by taking here, and that's game over. So, well, Michaelis thought that knight d7 was the best move, but basically white is just a clear pawn up here. But black played the unbelievably risky g5, knocking the bishop back. Bishop takes pawn. And here Mikanus writes that, well, he played f4 and said, I'd seen this possibility well in advance, but for a long time couldn't decide on it. The point is that such a sharp continuation demands accurate calculation. Having exhaustively tested the possible variations, I all the same dared to take this step. So, of course, it allows this check and then black takes the rook. And here Mikanas continues with pawn takes pawn, and, and as we're about to see, a very nice sacrificial continuation. In fact, he could just play queen takes bishop, and you can see that every single one of white's pieces is in the attack. This pawn on g5, ugly! White is going to be able to take here and just break through to the king, and there really isn't a good defense for black here. So yeah, that's the, the less spectacular way of winning. But pawn takes pawn, as Mikenas played, is beautiful and absolutely sound. Here's the point. Rook takes knight. Now, this is a very well-known attacking theme. That if bishop takes rook, queen d3, and you can see the f-pawn is blocked, um... Queen h7 mate is coming, and you can see there's a traffic jam here because the queen 
blocks the rook. The queen, well, that means the rook can't move, so the king can't move. Of course, you might know this theme. I mean, there are a lot of attacking games with this idea, but the, the really famous example is Fischer Benko from the US Championship in 1963-64. You'll find that game in Fischer's 60 memorable games. And black doesn't have a good defence here. Uh, Mikenas mentions queen b5 as a better defence, but, well, it is it is hopeless. Let's look at the game, because this was, this was wonderful. King g7. Queen d3. Now, if king takes rook, knight g4 check. If the king goes back, queen h7 mate. And if king e7, queen d6 is a nice checkmate. And of course, if bishop takes rook, then queen h7. So h5 played by Lebedev. And, well, that supposedly stops knight g4, as we'll see, it doesn't really. Um, and here, Mikenas played h4. Well, pushing that bishop away. So once again, bishop takes rook, queen h7 mate. And there is no way out for black here. If, let's say, queen d8, desperately wanting to exchange queens, then rook f7 and queen h7 and mate. And if bishop c1, then knight takes pawn. Again, just making room for the queen to come in. If king takes, this is nice, checks. And queen g6. Okay, let's see the game. So in the game, black played king takes. Well, all these white pieces in the attack. How does white finish off from here? There you go. I should I'll give it to you as a puzzle. White to play and checkmate. Not just win. White to play and checkmate. What's the move? Knight g4. If the king comes back, then queen d6. If the king comes here, queen h7. So pawn takes knight. And now what's the move? Here we go. Bishop e5. If king e7, we've got queen d6 mate. And king takes bishop, queen d4 checkmate. That's rather lovely. And Mikanus writes, the final position is impressive. Hmm. Problemists would have been excited if instead of the bishop at b1, a white pawn had stood at g4. Well, that's because he's talking about a pure mate in problem in yeah in problem chess, a pure mate where bishops uh, where where pieces only cover one square. That's apparently important. But anyway, um, it's still a pretty good position. But I think that even without this, my immortal game does not lose its value. Well, well said. Yeah, that is a lovely final position. Well, there you go. That was Vlad Vladas Mikanis's immortal game. And do check out Douglas Griffin's uh, website, uh, Soviet Chess History.